Good morning, YouTube. Welcome to my channel, Forever Altered. My name is Tammy, and I am currently in a relationship with a narcissist, narcissistic individual, and I created my channel to offer support to those of us that are still in the situation, period. I found a lot of information for people who were already free from their relationship, but very little for people that were still there. So with that being said, today I want to talk about why people stay. I think I've addressed this topic in the past, um, but I'm trying to do it again under a series that I'm calling It's Complicated, because it is very complicated. So this is a second video in my It's Complicated series, and this one uh, will discuss why people stay. Um, since nothing about the relationship that you're in is normal, then obviously nothing about the breakup is going to be normal either. I wore a special shirt today, so how true is that? Um, also, I wanted to say, unless a person has experienced firsthand what it's like to live with a narc, they will never understand its dimensions. They, you can talk till you're blue in the face, and they will just think you're crazier and crazier. They'll think you're batshit crazy. And um, the fact is, you probably are, but you weren't that way to begin with. You were driven that way by the narcissist. Anyway, um, our good qualities are really what keep us hooked. We never quit. You know, we persevere to the end. The um, ride or die philosophy. Uh, we were extremely committed. We're extremely committed individuals. Um, we are, we have a willingness to forgive that, you know, is monumental. Um, we see the best in people. We try to see the best in people. We overlook their um, negative attributes, and we try to focus on the positive. Um, we're very compassionate and giving. We are patient. We are em empathetic. Um, all of these qualities are used by the narc to entrap us, ensnare us into the relationship. All of these qualities make us perfect targets perfect targets for a narcissist who is by nature a user, a vulture of um, human trait consumption, of fuel consumption. <clears throat> so here we are with this wonderful set of, of attributes that you know most people would in a normal relationship would be so happy to have found someone like that, someone who is genuine and, and caring and giving of themselves and who puts others first, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in our situation, these characteristics make it just like a perfect storm for the narcissist. So reason number one, um, if we could just get them to see the error of their ways, you know, we, we're so shocked that they view us the way they do, like we've never been viewed as such a bad, disgusting, um, ugly, imperfect, stupid, whatever you want us to, whatever you've been called, person. Um, we, 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 we have such a shock and, uh, of of a time trying to wrap our minds around that being the view, anyone's view of us, that we just think it's an error in their thinking. You know, if we could just sum it up better, if we could explain it better, if we could prove ourselves more, <clears throat> they would see the error of their ways and, you know, everything would be normal. Um, because we're striving for normal. We're always striving for normal. And um, we know inherently down deep, our intuition is telling us this is not normal. You know, I've been in good relationships, I've been in bad relationships, uh, but none of it was like this. <clears throat> My daughter's in the other room, so 
<clears throat> she may do a guest appearance. If so, I apologize ahead of time. She's three. Um, I told her to sit and watch cartoons for a few minutes, but it may not happen. <clears throat> Reason number three, we are seeking concrete evidence. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Reason number two, maybe his he's right and we are blowing things out of proportion. Okay, so, you know, they, they're they really good at convincing us that we're the ones that are the problem. And um, so you're sometimes you think, well, maybe I was too harsh. Well, maybe... I did take it wrong. You know, maybe I'm, I did blow this out of proportion. I just need to, especially after time, because, you know, they do something, you know, tremendously outrageous, rage at you, whatever. And, and the day it happens, you're blown away and you're so, you know, devastated by whatever the situation was. But depending on the magnitude of it, you know, a little bit of time waters it down and makes you start thinking, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe I was I overreacted. And I mean, it can even be a big thing, you know, a huge. Uh, you know, you found them with someone else, cheated, they cheated on you, and you know, at first it's terrible, but then as the weeks go by and you kind of step back into what you, whatever is normal for your relationship, quote, and you start to think. You know, I don't know, you, you trick yourself into thinking it wasn't as bad as maybe you thought it was. Or you block it out completely, maybe. So, uh, but back to reason number three. We are seeking concrete evidence. Um, I mean, this is one I fall into. Uh, I, I've already shared with everybody. I <clears throat> had my suspicions and my feelings and I... I you know, tried my best to listen to my intuition. My narc is extremely secretive. He wants to keep everybody compartmentalized, and he has very few people in his life, very few. And um, every person that's in his life has a specific role. I can see that looking in. You know, I shared with you, I put spyware on his phone back in December. I was able to catch him cheating, which I suspected because he kept blaming me for it and I was able to catch him doing it and um, some you know one one situation more than one situation one situation was a girl he had been seeing for four years almost which we've been together almost five so that means almost the entire time we've been together he has had a relationship with someone else going on um, and then the other situations were I found videos that he had made with other people, and I found um, a couple, or I found one phone number of a girl that was willing to talk to me, and she told me that they met on a um, dating app, and then they hooked up, I think she said two or three times, I can't remember now, um, I don't remember if she said, I think she said in a motel, but anyway, for sex, that was it, it was just about that. Uh, which is disgusting to me, but I'm just saying that that's how she introduced it or told me. Anyway, so I, I got my concrete evidence, and you know, I'm still here. So uh, reason number three, you know, but here's here's the thing. They, they'll punish you for seeking that information. They'll punish you for asking questions of them. If, if I were to challenge him and ask him something, in fact, I have a little video clip or audio clip, but I don't have it ready to share right now. But um, where he a few weeks ago did started in on his accusations again, and um, he he has issues with even me talking to a plumber, for instance, that comes to the house, or I have apartments, I have buildings that need work done, I have a business, and coordinating all these things and he has problems with it he says I shouldn't be doing it but he doesn't want to do it or follow through um, and it needs done now not when you wake up at five in the afternoon you know so but he has a problem with that so he he'll make accusations and and um, I mean if if the guy that fixes the cooler mentions anything you know anything personal like well I got to pick my kid up at four so I need to leave um, he will fixate on that and say, you are talking about personal things with this person. Like, he's, it's just completely controlling because he, he is so afraid and insecure 
of losing his supply that he has to keep really strong reins on it. So he was <clears throat> making some kind of accusations and of cheating, and I said, I cannot believe you. I can't believe you're the one that has, you know, and he went ballistic. I mean ballistic, screaming at me, and uh, I actually left because it scared me so bad. I, I thought he was going to get violent. He typically doesn't get violent, but, um, well, he gets violent sounding extremely, but I mean, he, he typically does, he doesn't, he's not a hitter. He's a verbal abuser, but he was that mad that I was questioning that he may cross that line and I got the heck out of there. So you learn early on, you can't just go to them to ask them. You can't discuss a problem. You can't, you know, you, you don't do that. Um, because they will come unglued on you. They will punish you. Um, I think I also mentioned I, I talked to his sister. I was trying to talk to his sister, and I said, I need to talk to someone about him. And, and you know, I, I try not to involve my family in this situation because it's too stressful on them. They love me, and if they knew the stuff that went on, they would be sick about it. And, um, he lives far away from his family, but uh, he does talk to them. Well, he doesn't want me talking to his family. His family has come here a couple of times, uh, and both times he managed to make sure that they did not meet me. They met our daughter. He actually snuck out and took her, but they did not meet me. So he wants to car compartmentalize everybody, and I know that others have shared that same thing. Um, so it's really hard to get the concrete evidence, is my point. Um, it's very hard to get the evidence. You have to be shrewder than they are. And that sounds terrible, but it's the truth. Is it worth it? Yes, I, I believe it is. I felt like at the time it was a compromising of my values because it's something I, don't, I wouldn't ever dream of doing in a normal situation. But when your intuition is blinking, blinking, and telling you, you have got an issue here, and it's huge, and uh, it just keeps eating away at you, you eventually figure something out. And I know with him, most likely he's right back at it. Um, but, you know, it's something I have to deal with at this point. And truthfully, that person that he was seeing might have been a place for him to go that would have been out of here. So in that regard probably messed up. I should have found out there was a person and then kept it to myself and then pushed him a little harder because I finally knew he had some place else to go. But that's in hindsight. Anyway, number four, um, we've become addicted to the cycle. And I believe that happens to the best of us. Uh, we are seeking normal. As I said earlier, we're seeking some level of happiness in whatever situation we find ourselves. Uh, you're stuck in prison and, you know, you, you look out the window and watch the sun dancing on the leaves and that's enjoyment to you because you are so limited in your options. And not that that wouldn't be, but I'm saying you, you can, in the bleakest of circumstances, you try to find something good. And um, so you're, you're addicted to holding on to that something good that's coming and that traps you in the cycle. Look up cognitive dissonance and look up Stockholm Syndrome. I've talked about those before, but those play into that um, cycle. And that is a huge issue because the idea of leaving the situation makes it difficult because you actually have um, trauma bonds formed and uh, it's very painful. It's, it's a grief. It's definitely a grief. I spoke about this with somebody yesterday and um, it's difficult to get over and you you're you want to jump back in period it's, I mean just very very difficult but uh, and I will say this with my situation I've actually I haven't actually said this to anybody but about two months ago I guess maybe or maybe a little less I moved out and moved into this place which is my office which is I'm fortunate very fortunate um, actually he's in my big house which is on the same property, but I do have some distance from him, and um, that has given me some clarity and some space to breathe. Even though I still see him every day, I go to bed at night here, and my daughter can go 
stay with him or with me, but she's actually preferring to stay with me, um, which is a benefit, a good thing, because I've sort of gained back some, I hate to use the word control, but she's three, a little bit of control. I think she may be walking in, I can hear. Um, number five is you're too broken down mentally, um, exhausted, and, and you cannot make changes. I see that, I see. <clears throat> and this is a big one, mentally and emotionally becoming exhausted. And this is baby Calvin. And this is Zoe May. <laughs> All right, take that Zoe, or take baby Calvin out there. It'll be done in a minute. All right, love you. Um, broken down and mentally exhausted. And that is so, so true. You can't think straight when you're constantly in a fight or flight situation. Uh, you're in survival mode. Your ability to make clear decisions is definitely hindered by the constant stress, the emotional stress that you are under, and the um, attack that is very much de demonic in nature. Um, Mommy, I saw two little bunny rabbits. You saw two bunny rabbits? Outside. That's cool. Two rabbits right by the beginning. Okay, go out there. I'm almost done. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Uh, number six, you're financially yoked to that person. And I discussed this in a previous uh, video that I actually made earlier and you will find yourself financially yoked one two broad categories one you'll be in one or the other which is you're either the financial support system for the narc or the narc is uh, you know financially bound you they're they're the support they're the money and they've, they've withheld everything and you're broke without them and the bunny is standing that we're just standing over there okay um and I personally am the financial support in my situation, which does give me some edge, I guess, over um, a person that does not have the financial resources to walk away. Um, but then again, there are different, in that case, you, you know, if, if my narc was, if I was in his house, and knowing what I know in my situation, the fact that I have some cash and I can, you know, I have other places to go. If I was in that person's home, I would have left a long time ago because finances was not was not a stumbling block for me. Um, however, he has to leave my house, and that is a whole nother video. <coughs> so we. we um, the last thing is kids. The kids kids are involved in your fear of not being able to get the children away safely. So I'm going to close this video because um, I'm not going to, she's going to keep pushing to do something and she's impatient enough. So with that being said, I'm going to put some resources down below um, that I felt were helpful as far as the kids being involved because I think that's a major reason and I wanted to go into that more um, because we are fearful that we're going to walk away and, and have to share custody and or even worse lose custody of our children and we know the abuse that they have heaped on us so the idea that we would leave our children unprotected in that situation where we is terrifying and so I found a few resources and I'm going to post those uh, in the notes below um, and then I want to say this in light of that record 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 everything record every argument you can get good at using your phone to hit the little audio record button and save those recordings um, make notes save text messages anything and everything that you can do because if you, if and when you do leave and you have a battle on your hands where your kids are involved or are concerned, those will Mommy. be very, very important. Mommy. With that, I am closing Mommy. so I can go deal with my daughter. <laughs>
Have a great day. Please leave your comments below.